Mubarak, I think you can start. Okay, thank you. Um, good afternoon, good um, evening, good night, um, good morning, wherever you guys are. Um, and uh, happy Father's Day. So I'm going to talk about um, the cross-view geolocalization. That's the topic of the tutorial. As um, Teddy already corrected the title, so I'm going to actually cover same view and cross-view. And we'll start with a kind of general background of the geolocalization and then on focus on the uh, cross view localization. So um, also I will cover um, mostly our work. Uh, Teddy did a very good job covering lots of uh, great work which has been happening in, in this area, uh, pretty active area of research. Uh, so let's uh, get started. So geolocalization, there are two types of geolocalization. One is called pixel-wise geolocalization, um, which is more like um, the, um, from the point of view of the photogrammetry and the classical definition. And other is called image-based geolocalization, which is more computer vision kind of definition. So in the pixel-wise geolocalization, we are given a query image and we want to geolocalize each pixel by aligning an image with a geodetically accurate reference image, okay? And image-based geolocalization, which is like given a query image, uh, we want to determine GPS location by matching it with the geotech reference images. So with this context, um, I will talk, give you a very brief introduction of pixel-wide geolocalization. Geolocal That's where we started this work. And in particular, talk about geotechnic alignment of aerial video frames, and then go on to image-based geolocalization. In that, I will cover SEM view and also cross view. So um, this is a work we did a long time ago. So the idea here is that we have um, aerial video, like a UAV is flying, getting a aerial frames, and we have reference data, and we have telemetry, which is called metadata, okay? So one important thing you will notice here is called the viewpoint where this imagery is taken. So it can be from the top, nodder view, or it can be high oblique view or low oblique view. And depending on the view, the images which will we have to deal with will vary. So um, suppose these are the examples of the aerial video imagery. So um, what we have in the geo registration that we have reference data, which is called digital ortho quad. It's like a Google Earth. So here, every pixel has a GPS location. GPS location is longitude, latitude. Then we also have the dame, which is called digital elevation map. So for every pixel, we have a height. That What's the elevation of that point? And then we can take a reference image and can actually visualize from in many different viewpoints. So now important thing here is that we have to have these different coordinate system. And this is given from the metadata telemetry. So we have the word coordinate system. And with respect to word coordinate system, we have the vehicle, the airplane. We have latitude, longitude, and height, and its orientation. And then we have a camera coordinate system, you know, the, the, the uh, system which is there and with respect to the word, and then there we have the location and orientation of our camera. So then we essentially have to build a sensor model, uh, which is a series of transformation to relate the camera coordinate system with the word coordinate system, okay? And these are the series of transformation and uh, that we have to model. And these, this is just an example of some of these transformation here, as you know, each of these transformations, either rotation or translation, and we'll have to actually account for all of those. It's a real sensor model. Now, once we have this relationship between the word and the camera, then we have to take a picture, which means we have to have perspective projection, the traditional model of image formation, and that kind of complete the sensor model. Now here, we can actually find the image coordinates of a word point 
using these set of transformations and we can actually have the real uh, geometrical relationship between all these. And so one important thing uh, which is done in the georegistration, the traditional georegistration, that we need to orthorectify the mission image, like an image taken from UAV, because as I mentioned, that the image taken from the Nodder view is very different compared to from the oblique view. And the reference image is always from the Nodder view, from the, from the top. So there's a bridge, there's a gap which we need to bridge and uh, this uh, otherwise it will create a lot of problem. So now orthorectification essentially is that we have say seen here and say we took a perspective image like this, you know, we have a camera, we have an image plane and focal length, all those things. And there are different heights of these surfaces. Then we essentially want to take a picture from the top, okay? Because that's where the reference image is. And that's where the dame will play a part because we need to know what's the height of each of these uh, place in the scene. So once we do that, then um, in order to you know, accomplish this, so we have to have a sensor model. We have to model the sensor, uh, which is shown here. We have to have mission image and we have to have a reference environment like a dam, then we can auto rectify. So here as example, this is the mission image, this auto rectify, which we are looking from the top. And there are some more examples like that, okay? Now we want to align the auto-rectified image with the digital auto core, where every pixel has a GPS location. So this is the GOQ. And when we project that image, we just auto-rectify it, it may look like that. It's not aligned. So now we want to align this image with the rest of, with, with the um, reference image. Then we will know GPS location for every point in the mission image. And this alignment is traditional, what we do in computer vision, like we can make a panorama, we can assume there's a, a homography between these two images, uh, there is you know, uh, affine transformation to simplify and so on. And then it may look like that. Now the, for the alignment, uh, you can use these points, matching points from reference to mission, and make them fit the transformation, or you can do direct method like uh, special temper derivatives and so on. Okay, so so that's you know pretty classical way people uh, used to do, and st still people are doing. So now that was about the pixel by geolocalization. Geolocal now I will move on to the image-based geolocalization, and um, for that, the idea is there's no metadata. We just have an image, okay? There's no telemetry in it. And we don't have a sensor model because it's very complicated to model that. Um, and we don't actually have the geodetically accurate reference image, okay? We just have a geotech images. So now this will be a course level geolocalization. We won't be able to know the G GPS location for each pixel and mission image, but we'll know just one, just, just the whole global GPS location. So this problem has uh, been also called where am I problem? You know, there was a workshop a long time ago, 2005 ICCB, you know, Zick Zaleski has a context on that. So that is, uh, as uh, Teddy showed an example of LA, uh, you know, somebody got lost. Um, so it's like that. So you're lost, you take a picture and then you want to find out where you are. It's called where am I problem? And this picture happened to be taken in Pittsburgh, and this is the GPS location, longitude, latitude. Okay, so when we started this work, we we got the reference images from Google Street View, about hundred thousand images, and these were the test images from different uh, websites like Picasso, Panoramia, and Flickr. So um, I'm going to talk about a couple of uh, these works we have done over the years. So the first work we did. Uh, which uses the um, generalized minimum click formulation of this problem. So the idea is very simple uh, as, as I think Teddy has gone through uh, in detail. So we have a query image and we find these shift points. These are the shift points. Then we have a reference images. There are a lot of reference images. For each shift point, we find the nearest neighbor. So this is the first nearest neighbor, first image. For this point, this is the first nearest neighbor and so on. So a simple way will be that each of these mates will give a vote to the reference image and whichever 
you know, reference image get the la largest number of words, we say that's the uh, match. And then whatever GPS location that reference image has, we say that's a GPS location of machine image. That's very, very simple, okay? Now, uh, the problem is the first nearest neighbor uh, will not, may not be always correct. So suppose here we look at the, you know, the four nearest neighbor, and in, in this case, maybe the third one is better, and this, this one, the second one's better, and one, this one is the first one, maybe, and so on. So now that's a problem that, you know, if we just look at the first one, we'll come, come with the wrong matches, and we will end up with the wrong GPS location. So um, what we do in this work, we say, well, let's not take just one, let's take a several of those. So we get, uh, for each shift point, we get, suppose, you know, bunch of these near sniper, first one, second one, and so on. So this become a cluster. And then for the second mission point, we have these nearest neighbor and so on. So now we want to select the consistent set of nearest neighbor, looking at the, all these points, okay? So what we do, we build this K-part type complete graph we collect, we connect every point with all other points. And then the idea is that from there, we want to come up with a click, you know, the click which uh, minimizes or maximizes some cost function. So this happened to be a click. And um, so the GMCP will pick exactly one point from each cluster. And um, then we want to select such that, that the cost of click is minimized and, and uh, somehow that, that gives you better um, match. And it's kind of using some kind of global information compared to the uh, local information or consistency that we cannot just locally match each point. So here are the examples. So we can get a query image like this. We can localize within seven meters and another example and another example. And this is a city wide. So we have, you know, so in some cases we have larger error, but this was one of the first work and this works pretty well. Now, traditionally we uh, measure how good we are doing by looking at the error threshold within how many meters we can localize correctly. And this is a percentage, how many, what percentage of these images we can do. As you can see, if you just do a chance, you know, th this is uh, pretty bad. And at that time, Schindler and Zelensky paper was the top one so it is here, and then we can compare with other ones, you know, we do pretty well. So um, that was the image year localization using the consistency of the local matches, because local matches are always ambiguous. Then now there were limitations of this approach, as, you, as I mentioned, that we had a constraint that we want to select exactly one nearest number per query feature. Now the problem is that if all the nearest neighbor we selected for a particular query feature, if they are wrong, then we will have problem, it's especially the outlier will have problem. So it will, it will kind of uh, create a problem with other selection, okay? Um, and then we use simple voting scheme, you know, that's kind of uh, pretty simple. Uh, and also the, this um, GMCP is anti-hard problem. It's computationally very expensive. So then we will go to the next thing we did, um, uh, which uses the idea of constraint dominant cell. And so here the goal is that we want to have a fast method, we want to have accurate method, and we want to handle outliers. And also it can be scalable to large, larger scale. So approach is very similar to the previous one. So we take a query image, we get the local features, uh, shift features, and then we select these nearest neighbor, but here we have idea that we want to dynamically select that. We don't have to have fixed number of uh, nearest neighbor. If the nearest neighbors are similar, we don't have to waste time there. And we prune some of these, we, you know, we, we say particular mission point, maybe that's not important. And then using that, we again do the k apartheid graph. And now from there, we compute what is called the dominant set. So this is a very different idea as compared to the GMCP. And it's basically it computes the consistent clusters. Now, once we have this dominant set, then uh, we have the post-processing, uh, which takes the query image, 
and then these three diamond sets and mill the graph. And from there, we compute constraint dominant set. Dominant set such that which has a query because we want to find the match of a query. So here, this, this um, graph was built on based on the local matches. Now we got these reference images, which are dominant set, which are closer. Now we bring in query image and we get another uh, stage of that. And finally, we get the correct match. So that's a general idea. Um, so now what is the dominant sets? So it's a age weighted generalization of click. It's similar to click. And so it's a set which is, we select a subset of vertices, which is coherent and compact. And here's the example. So here, let's say we have three nodes, okay? So these are similarities of these nodes, you know, one in five, one in three similarities, 20 and so on. So this is dominant set because they are very similar, okay? Um, now we add a fourth node um, and this is similarity of the fourth node to all other nodes and they are also similar and this weight is positive. So this is a dominant set. Now we add the fifth node. This is similarity, which is very different from the rest of them. And this is negative, And therefore this is not dominant set. So that's kind of you know, intuitive you know, explanation of what dominant set is. So now constraint dominant set, similar idea, but we have a constraint. So let's say we have, we have a set. And this constraint is here that we want to select the dominant set which contains this. So therefore that this will be a constraint dominant set because it will contain this or this will be a constraint dominant set. Okay, so that's a kind of difference. So now in dominant set is age weighted generalized maximum click. Uh, so we are given as affinity matrix A and which is shown here then essentially we can formulate as a maximization problem. We want to find X such that this is maximized, okay? And then once we find the X, of course we have this restriction that is X is a simplex. So therefore the summation of all the element X should be one, that should be positive and so on. And then the support of X as he actually is a dominant set. All the elements for which the value is uh, greater than zero, um, it is positive, which is you know a dominant set. So it's a pretty simple idea, and it captures like internal and external coherence condition for a cluster, and this is based on the work uh, which was published um, in 2007. So now constant dominant set is very similar. The only difference is here we have this IQ matrix, and this is uh, Q is a query, the constraint. So what we do that we make a diagonal matrix uh, in which the diagonal elements are set to one, uh, which correspond to the vertices V minus Q that, you know, we subtract the Q vertices from V, V and we make them um, one as compared to other one, make them zero. So that's a constraint imposes that. So now using this, uh, we get pretty good results. And so we apply to uh, the data set which we did the previous paper, uh, Google Street View, and then we collected another data set uh, which we call the World City data set, and um, which is shown here. And this has about 300,000 Google Street View images, uh, 14 cities. Uh, these are the cities from USA, this from Australia, this from Europe, and test states was about 500 GPS take unconstrained images and uh, which were downloaded from Flickr and Panoramia. So these are the overall results. Uh, again, we are showing the error threshold and percentage of the correct retrieval. So as you see that we do pretty good, which is here and compared to even our own method, which is a GMCP, which is here and all these other methods. So that's really improves and it is a pretty fast better. So the, these are the, some results, uh, qualitative results. So for this one, we can look at like 70 meters, it's about five meters and 10 and, and so on. And this also shows you on the map. So this is the ground truth, this is our localization. So this is you know pretty reasonable within some error we can localize. 
So um, that was about the um, geolocalization, um, image-based geolocalization using constraint amino acid. Yes. Arif, we had a question on this one. Uh, before you go to the next one, could, could we ask a question? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. A uh, question was, uh, what happens uh, if you have points on the query image uh, which are not there in your database images? When you're finding the click, you need all, uh, all, uh, you couldn't, couldn't expect all the points to be there, right? So how does it handle that mm -hmm. some of these points may not be there? In, 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 you're, you're seeing it from an angle where points. Yes, have... yes, yeah. yeah. So that's fine. So see that it's true that um, you don't you don't have to find all the points in the from the query to the reference image. Of course, there will be some points missing, but you want to find enough points so that you have um, consistent matches. So it's of course you know will be. Will, will some will be missing, which will not be in reference images, and um, some will be in reference image, which will not be in a query. So that's possible. So it will depend on how many uh, points you start with the um, in the query image. Uh, you can do just two three points, and maybe you won't have. So you'll have to you'll have to you know use several points. But it has to have some overlap. There has to be some matches. Otherwise, there's no no way to match. Okay. 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 Any other other question? Okay. So I'll continue. So this was um, about the image-based geolocalization, where same view because both were a street view, ground view we call them. Now let me go to cross view. So cross view is much harder um, because there's a, this domain gap. Um, so image from different viewpoints are visually different, okay? And images they capture from different lighting condition. It can be, you know, some from one viewpoint to other may be complex. So traditional SIFT, HOG, and all these classical features we use, use are, will be very different. So here's an example. So this is a ground image. And this is the bird's eye view, uh, oblique view image. And all these matches are wrong using shift points. Okay, so that's a big problem. So therefore this, we cannot continue this method. So now as um, I have talked about last two pieces, uh, we use the shift features and they were working for the same view. Now what we are gonna do Instead of shift feature, we are going to use the building features. So we are going to match buildings and that will help us to do cross view matching. So this was paper 2017 we had. So the proposed approach is that we are given a query image like a street view and we have a bunch of reference images. They are bird's eye view. And uh, this looks very different than these. And that's a problem. So what we do we detect buildings. This of course will work only, you know, uh, the urban areas, if the, you go to forests and so on, so on will work there. So, which is fine. So these are buildings in street view. These are the buildings in the bird's eye view. And then we will match buildings instead of shift points. And we will again retrieve the canier neighbor for each curry building. And then we'll do the dominant state selection and then we geolocalize. So the, so the general approach is same as we have been doing, okay? So now in all this work, you know, uh, I mean, if you do just image retrieval, it's different. There are lots of data sets as, uh, as Teddy went through, uh, there are a lot of work. But if you want to do geolocalization, there are not enough data sets, that's a big problem. So we have to, for everyone, we have to collect our own data set. So first thing we did, we collected this data set uh, for Pittsburgh and Orlando. And um, so for the GPS location, we got four pairs, the different headings, you know, front, back, left, right. And then also we got the oblique view and we spend about 300 hours uh, for annotation uh, with four undergraduate student, high school student. So these were the locations about um, 1500 location um, in Pittsburgh. Uh, we collected these images 
and um, these are the images and the buildings that you see here. As you see, they look very different. Even for humans, very difficult to say this is the same as this, okay? And um, Orlando simulated about 1300 images, and these are buildings. So uh, first we have to do, we have to detect buildings. At that time, you know, faster RCNN was pretty good. So we got these uh, training and testing and we got from street view and also bird's eye view. And we, you know, trained this model and it, it worked pretty well. Uh, then we want to do building matching. Uh, and um, we use the Siamese network as Terry talked about, you know, you can start Siamese, then you can go triplet. And actually, I didn't know the system is but it seemed pretty interesting where average precision is um, maximized. Um, we'll definitely look at that. So, um, so the, you know, the Siamese network is um, that he went through that, you know, look at the contrast loss, you know, where we look at the distance, uh, you create distance between these features and there's this margin. And uh, if they are the positive pair, this is one negative pair, this is uh, zero and, and, and this traditional thing. So uh, now after that, then we want to get these buildings and for each building as we did before, then we get the nearest neighbor building. Uh, this is from street view and these are from bird's eye view. So we get a, for each one, we get this cluster and then we again make this um, um, k partite graph as, as we have been doing before. And um, then we get um, the, the dominant set, which is shown here. And um, that gives us the match. And so experiment results are, so first we show here the buildings we can detect pretty well. And these are the confidences of each building detection. Um, and um, this is the bird's eye view. Um, so, you know, we get pretty good if it's, we just take a pre-trained model, it's like this, but when we fine tune with our data set, it improves significantly. Um, and this is the building matching result. So this street view building matches with this one. This is the first nearest neighbor. And then when you were matching 40,000 candidates from, you know, candidates from the bird's eye view. In this case, the third nearest neighbor is the right one. Um, and here, query is bird's eye view but the reference is the street view. And so these are more examples here. So now we selected here uh, about 100 uh, nearest neighbor for each of these, and that worked pretty well. So again, we can show you within how many meters we can geolocalize. So this is, if you use just shift matches, as, as we see, that's pretty bad, pretty you know, poor. Now here we do the building matches but we use only one view, but the street view has four views, you know, front, back, left, and right. And when you use front view, we, we can significantly increase that. So in summary, uh, we solved this geolocalization problem, um, cross view image matching and detect buildings instead of set points, we match buildings and retrieve care nearest neighbor for each query. And then we have dominant selection because the point is that when you do the local matches, they are pretty ambiguous. You know, they, they, you cannot, based on a local match, decide which image matches. So we have to have some consistency uh, constraint, and this constraint dominant set or GMCP uh, that is doing that, and that way we can improve the results. Now, other way is that they will your matches. First is your points are reliable. And second is that your matching is very good as they are doing in super glue. And there are lots of these steps here, which is pretty interesting work. I also watched this uh, last year uh, in CVPR, the workshop. So either you do very well local matches, then you don't have to worry about consistency, or you can rely on the uh, local matches, whatever you can do, then you have to have some consistency. So it's, you know, it's kind of balance. Other thing you uh, notice here that um, 
we have moved from the handcrafted features, um, SIFT feature and SIFT descriptor, classical computer vision, to here we detect buildings and we used to detect buildings also classical computer vision, but then the features are the Siamese features, okay? These are the deep learning features. So we are kind of getting a deep learning now, uh, detected buildings using deep learning and detected features. You know, it's not a SIF descriptor what uh, David Lowe came up with. This is a descriptor. We don't know, it's just a feature vector it gives you. Okay, so now the last, uh, uh, piece is that we are going to actually get rid of all the local features, shift buildings, anything. We are going to look at global features. And this is a purely deep learning end to end. Because in these things, uh, it is still classical computer vision that you have these different steps. Uh, and then we have to come up with uh, the descriptor and so on. So now we are going to do global image features. So this is the work we had last ICCV. And um, here we want to do uh, ground to ADL, okay? So um, cross view image matching. Um, so we have um, the street view panorama and uh, these are the aerial views. And given this, we want to find out which is the correct match, okay? And uh, it's very difficult. To, to see that. So what we do, we take the, the ground image, we synthesize aerial view using gain, okay? So that's where deep learning is coming in now. So the synthesis fill the gap between the aerial and also the street view. So um, then we will find out that while Actually, this is a correct match for this. So now we want to learn these joint features and we want to fuse these features, okay? We want to fuse the synthetic feature, real features, aerial ground and all these things. We want to come up with best features which we can help to match and then retrieve and do the geolocalization. And of course we use the multi-scale which, which always helps. So our approach is that we do the cross view image synthesis followed by joint feature learning. And so um, given um, the street view panorama like this, and also we get edge detection on that. So this is input and the output is an aerial view and also semantic segmentation because we add this additional loss and it, it actually helps. And this is your gain. Okay, the generator. So now once we have the I prime, which is, a, which is the synthesized aerial image of the ground panorama, which is shown here. And then we have the crown panorama and we have the real aerial, okay? This is for our training. So we do the encoding of all these three like this. And then we get these features, ground features, aerial features, and synthesize aerial feature of the corresponding the ground panorama. So then um, we concatenate these two features, do the fully connected and we get FG star. And then we get another fully connected, we get FA star. And so we want to say these should match. So we want say they have got the same image, okay? I mean, same location taken one ground, other one area. And so generator architecture we used from the previous paper we had in 2018, um, which is shown here. So input is the panorama and also edge image. And then we have two forks. One generates the aerial image, other generates the semantic segmentation, and these are the details there. So, um, so now main thing here is that how do we learn these features which can help us? So uh, details are that we have the ground image and the aerial image, we have these encoders and we get the ground features and aerial features. 
and of course, uh, one loss is we want to minimize the loss. Okay, we want to do that, and we use triplet loss, and so on. I'm going to talk about that. So then, but this is a new thing. So we take the ground and get the aerial, and encoding that, and we get the FA prime, and then they they do the weight sharing. Um, then we have this auxiliary loss. We also want to make them, they should be similar, okay? And um, so this, of course, we only use during training. We don't use during the inference, we don't have to use this one. So now feature fusion is that we get these features, FG, FJ star, FA prime, and then we concatenate these two, we get FG star, and then FA star, and then we do the uh, loss, it's a weighted loss, I'm gonna talk about that. So loss functions are uh, triplet loss, um, and this is a traditional one as um, Terry talked about, the positive and negative, uh, it's a margin. Uh, you can take um, this uh, represent by D, DP minus D, so it's a simpler version, this one. Now, um, there's something called soft margin triplet loss. So instead of this, we can like do this, take the, 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 the distance exponent, and then you take a log and you can even put a temperature here. And we found out this works better than these traditional triplet loss. So uh, then we have this weighted, the, the loss between IG and IA and I prime and I, because as I told you that we have auxiliary loss and this other loss. So that's it. So we use, um, you know, satellite uh, ground panorama pairs. And this is a traditional data set, CVUSA, um, 35,000 pairs uh, for the testing, 8,000 for the test, 35 for training and 8,000 for testing. And the rural areas, I think this was from Janus, uh, not Janus, the Finder program. Uh, and we collected this data set ourselves, Poland or Pittsburgh. The problem with this is it's, it's again a major tool. It's not a geolocalization because it doesn't have any GPS location. So we wanted to do geolocalization. So this we collected and covers urban area and it has GPS information. So CVUSA. Um, so we are going to show you top one, top 10, and top 1%. Now, if you use the, the synthesized aerial and the original aerial, this two stream baseline, we get something like this. And if you use the, you don't do anything, just aerial and the synthesized, uh, aerial and the ground actually works better. And then we can look at the aerial and synthesized aerial and, uh, but when we use the, um, the aerial and the ground, and then after that, when we use the um, fusion, then we get the best one, 48%. Um, and you compare this with other methods, um, we have a huge improvement on the same data set, you know, 48 from 22 to 48, which is very, very good. So then we can look at the recall accuracy. So this is top K um, and this uh, percentage top K and this is uh, one method, this other method and these are comparing method two, two stream and this is um, the you know, different versions of what images we are using and this one is joint feature learning. So which works better than all these. And then when we do a feature fusion, which works even better. So now if you look at the image retrieval, so this is a ground query and this is a synthesized aerial. And these are the nearest neighbor, top nearest neighbor. And this one is the uh, correct one. The, and um, for these one, we get all the first year neighbors are correct one to the green. And um, so this one, the second one, this is a fourth one, which is, you know, not that bad. Um, failure cases. So this is a ground and this is synthesized aerial. And top one was this. 
what the ground truth is. The ground truth has a water, but if you look at the ground query here, there's no water. So it's very difficult to take this one to put in water. Uh, so the real one, the 13th position we got, um, the correct one, but um, which is reasonable. Again, here is a failure. Now, as you see, I mean, there's not much different between what we got, what was the correct one. And it's just a weather change. Um, also here, now in this one, you don't see any houses. We got synthesized images like this, but the um, this one is the ground truth, which is houses, the top one. So we got the wrong one here, something like that. So then we want to do the actual geolocalization on the Orlando Pittsburgh data set. So here uh, are our numbers. And um, so same idea that we can do feature fusion pretty good. And, um, and this is the error threshold within how many meters we can do. So simple two stream is this, but if you do the feature fusion, we can do better. Um, now we can do major retrieval on Orlando Pittsburgh, same as we did before, CVUSA. So this is a ground query, and this is a top one, and this is a correct one, okay? And with, we can localize within zero meters. And this one, also top one, within two meters and four meters and 4.75 meters, uh, which is pretty good. Um, now we can do aerial to ground also because the same thing we can just change, okay? Reverse problem. So we'll synthesize a ground panorama from aerial. Um, so again, these are the numbers. So we do pretty good with um, when we do the feature fusion, 44% uh, compared to 15 or 27. Um, so these are retrieval. So aerial query here, and then synthesize ground panorama. And then this is the first one, correct match. And for this one also, correct one, which is, I mean, possible scale like this one. I don't know how you got it. Um, so things like that. Um, so, so we can also look at these um, recall curves. Again, when we do the, the feature fusion, the last one, we can get uh, pretty good compared to all these other ones. So in summary, um, so we have this novel practical approach to cross view matching. Um, we fill that domain gap by synthesized images and that's the beauty of the game. And um, significant improvement uh, on top one and top 10 accuracy uh, on the SOTA and CV USA. And um, this kind of can be used uh, to other view transformations, uh, can be horizontal or vertical directions. So that is uh, this paper. And, uh, professor, so I have yeah. a quick question, yeah. Yes, so, yes. So, so uh, yeah, the, the work you presented actually is a very promising, it's a very uh, interesting approach, like using GAN to synthesize the image to help the matching problem, bridge the domain gap. It looks like that uh, it depends on what kind of thin class inside the, the view. For example, if you do have some class like water, you know, those class, maybe that, that will degrade the performance. So uh, do you think that maybe apply some mechanism like attention, those kind of things to focus more on those more meaningful uh, class to help the match? Do you think whether that's a, a, a kind of direction for your work or you already cover it in your current work? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a very good point. And see the problem with this um, today, the the field, the way the field is going and the disruption from deep learning. Uh, as, as you know, there are thousand papers being uploaded every day on archive. So there's so, so much work going on. So it's very hard to keep track of. So, you know, as you see that, you know, Gain was very popular a few years ago, and you know, this is the result of gain. Then, you know, and the matching the 
SAMEs and triplet laws and all those things. Uh, now the attention and transformer is the most popular thing. We actually have a very nice paper on transformer and vision. Uh, you guys can look at that. Yes, so, so the answer is yes, we are looking into transformer attention and uh, that of course uh, can do better than these approaches. Hi, Babak, I had a question too. Uh, yes. You, you, you took the ground image and uh, uh, synthesized an aerial image and also a semantic map. Uh, what happens if you also, you could have done semantic segmentation of the ground image also and given it as an input uh, to the GAN, right? Uh, you just gave it an edge as an input. Would it, would it have, would, it might have helped if we had also given the semantic map as an input. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a that's a good idea. Actually, we are we are trying this for some other thing. The, we are working on this video registration instead of single image. We are doing this, you know, multiple images of frame. But yeah, that's that's a good idea. So see that the thing is that um, in all these things, so you have to you know have the semantic segmentation uh, offline work you know done for all these. Um, and um, so for training is okay for the um, for the inference, then the edge detection is easier than the semantic segmentation. But yeah, I agree, it's a good idea. We haven't tried that, but yeah, it should it should also help. And uh, I had another question. Did it? You, yeah. It would be interesting to see you did it both with ground to aerial and aerial to ground render. So. Uh, what happens if you combine the results from both to make your final? Yeah, in a way that, I mean, are you saying that we, we did combine the features, right? I told you the feature fusion, that's what it's doing. Is that what you're saying or? Yeah, I was wondering if to make the final choice, you also do it the reverse way and check <laughs> or something. Oh yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's true. So I mean, you, then you have to have the, you know, both reference data set for the, yeah yeah that's also it's like a cycle it's a cycle consistency yeah yeah that's that's good yeah okay so um so i think i'm almost done so um summary is that um i started pixel wise geolocal localization you know we, we started this work um a long time ago 98 um um darpa avas and um, I was doing Subartical and Harris Corporation. That's where I got introduced to. And actually, you know, Sarnaf was there and uh, Rama's group uh, with SRI was there. So it was pretty, my first type of program to expose to. So this was pixel wide geolocalization to traditional photogrammetry people where you look at um, the um, tie points they used to call and, but main thing was the having sensor model and all metadata and names and all those things. Um, and, um, but it's a very fine geolocalization. You can find GPS location on each pixel and that's what is used for targeting. Um, then um, the image-based geolocalization, which is like more computer vision, uh, image retrieval. Um, so talk about same view, street view to street view and uh, maximum click and the concerned amino state um, then I went to cross view geolocalization uh, where we did the bird's eye view to street view and then I ended discussion on the aerial to ground view. So um, if you look at, you know, the, the some, you know, Bert, Bertol Horn used to say that computer vision, you know, you need to have good features, you know. If the features are good, actually he's a very nice example in his book, um, talking about the two brothers got confused because they were not looking at the right features. If the features are good, then you don't need much um, um, much analysis or you know, matching you know, criteria or all these statistical methods. And you know, uh, if the features are not good, then you can try lots of these methods, still it won't work. So that has been kind of um, focus on computer vision and um, the classical, uh, I mean, this 
the geodetic alignment of aerial the features were uh, what they call tie points uh, and some correlation features traditionally they used to, they still use that i think um, and um, so tie points correspond with handcrafted features okay corners and so on and then you can also use direct methods you know especially temporal derivatives you know the great work from si son of um, um, how you make a panorama and all this thing um, so then the the point here is that well you can get these local features but this local features matching is ambiguous and you need to put the consistency um, and come up with the right match because these features can be you know incorrect and that can be a problem so there's a click maximum click idea there um, then um, also concern I mean said is better than the maximum click uh, but again handcrafted features okay and that's why this uh, David Lewis you know 50,000 or more than that citations big uh, big impact on computer vision um, <clears throat> now this is where you know the deep learning is kind of sneaking in that while you know building people have been working on this long time and even these photogrammetry people have been working on detecting buildings but I think these deep learning methods work better without their learning based methods. Um, and the features, you know, just using SAMIs or something or triplet loss. So this, those features are better than SIF descriptor and so on. So um, then, as you saw, the aerial to ground, and you can get rid of everything. You don't have to detect features, you don't have to have a descriptor, you don't have to have matches and you don't have to have the um, you know the consistency uh, click or you know GMCP or constant I mean to say just you get one feature for the whole image and that's it so that's the end to end of course you know this does not have explainability it was easier that you can detect features so oh, this feature made wrong you can explain and so on we are the modular this is just one black box and uh, it works better. Uh, we have good results and that's the most emphasis uh, in this review process. And that's where we are. Thank you. Any more questions from anyone?